But we all know by now, because I've told on myself, that I am a little out of my element in talking about bodybuilding because I've tried and I just don't stick to it. There was a time, though, when we first moved here that I was on one of those little spurts of energy where I was like, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go to the gym. And then I looked at my schedule and I was like, all right, so if I'm going to the gym, I'm going early because I don't have time for nothing else. So I was getting up obnoxiously early to go to the gym. And you see, I don't like getting up early. I like going to bed late, or early, I'm sorry, I like going to bed early. I also like sleeping in late. I'm not a night person or a morning person. I'm a midday person, just what I am. I always try to go to bed early. It doesn't help me get up any earlier. But anyway, so I was trying to get up early, but I definitely hit that snooze button a few times, every single time, which meant then I was crunched for time, and something had to go. And it seemed like the thing that went every morning was my breakfast. And I didn't eat before I went to the gym. Anyone ever go to the gym when they just haven't had enough to eat? It is not a good time. Especially when it's like 4.30 in the morning and you have anything to eat because then you haven't had anything to eat. And you go and you're lacking in energy and you just can't get through a workout. All that to say, Everybody needs to eat. It's very important that we eat, that the whole body eats, because without food, we can't function. You'll see what that means as we go. Last time, last teaching Sunday, which was the first Sunday of last month, we talked about what? Who remembers? Yeah, Passover, Passover Seder, the Passover meal. And in that, we talked about two specific things. I called them the superfoods of the feast. Remember? There was two things that Jesus used during that last supper, which was a Passover meal. He used the zapfun. And remember what the zapfun was? The zapfun was, at the beginning of the meal, whoever was organizing or orchestrating the meal would break a piece of matzah, and the bigger piece they would put away, they would literally hide it for later in the meal, right? At the end of the meal, they would pull that thing back out after the meal, and they would then all partake in that piece of matzah at the end of the meal. And that represented the Passover lamb. So for us, that represents Jesus is our Passover lamb. Remember? Then the other element that Jesus focused on, I don't think I said this term because it's really hard to say. Um, you got you to gotta get all the saliva in the right places of your mouth. It's called the kas shlishi. Yeah, that's fun. Um, that was the third cup of wine. Remember there was four cups of wine during the meal? The third cup represented redemption. Specifically, in the Passover meal, it represented redemption from slavery because G- or, sorry, God brought the Jewish people out of Israel and rescued them from the slavery that they were in, from the captivity that they were in. And we said that Jesus chose that cup of wine specifically because of what he was going to do and did do on the cross in pouring out his blood for our redemption, so that we can be free from slavery to sin. Right, so that's a recap. This is what Jesus did as he served his disciples in that Last Supper, that Passover meal. In that whole thing, Jesus was acting in service to his disciples, right? He served his disciples. And that was good, right? And today, if we fast forward like 2,000 years about, we don't take communion that same way, right? We We don't do a full Passover meal, and that's okay, right? But we have to remember what those elements meant 
because they're important. But it still made me wonder or question, what did the early church do? Right? I ask myself this question a lot. I, I like history a little bit, and I really like the history of the early church, and it's just a fun thing to study, right? Now, I want to be clear, as we go through this, I don't necessarily think there's anything wrong with the way that we do communion. We just can't forget the meaning behind communion, right? So as we ask this question of what the early church did, I'm not saying that we need to do the same thing, right? Times change, things change. But there's a reason that they did things. So that's what we're looking at this morning. So I wondered, I asked myself a few questions. Maybe, maybe the early church saw what Jesus did and was like, huh, that's cool. We'll remember. And then they did, that's all they did. Maybe they did a full Passover meal, right? I don't know. So I looked into it. And I found a couple things. So what we're going to do last week, last week, it wasn't last week. It was four weeks ago. Last time we studied communion, we looked at Passover, which was a long time ago, and then we went forward to Jesus, right? This morning, I want to look at after Jesus, after the New Testament ended, and then walk ourselves back to Jesus, okay? So that's what we're going to do this morning. So the first thing that we're going to look at are a couple historical pieces that show us what the early church did in different ways, okay? Everyone say, this isn't scripture. This isn't scripture. This is just what they did, okay? There's some historical documents. The first thing we find is Pliny's letter. That's a slide. Pliny's letter. If you're taking notes, there it is. You can Google it later. Not now. Pliny's letter. Pliny's letter is a document that was found and dated to about 112 A.D., Okay, so this is really just after the New Testament books are completed, okay? So this is Pliny's letter. Pliny was a Roman governor, so he was a leader of an area that the Roman Empire had, right? And the um, emperor at the time was Emperor Trajan. Emperor Trajan didn't like Christians, okay? This is part of the early church's persecution. Emperor, Emperor Trajan didn't like Christians very much. Pliny, being a governor, a ruler over an area, started to investigate the Christians in his area, and then he wrote this letter to ask the emperor what he should do. And as a part of the letter, he said this. This is what Pliny found. I'm just going to read it. He said this. He said, on a fixed day, the Christians were accustomed to meet before dawn and to recite a hymn emphatically to Christ as to a God. Imagine that. And to bind themselves to an oath. After the conclusion of this ceremony, it was their custom to depart and meet again to take food. So, the reason I'm reading this is because this gives us a glimpse into what the church did at about 112 AD, right? what they do? Well, they did what we're doing this morning, really, right? On a fixed day. God, scholars think that was probably a Sunday, right? Because that's generally what the idea is. They came together. They recited a hymn. They said some oaths. Probably praying is what Pliny was looking at. And then they met to eat food. Scholars believe this eating food, this meal, was a time of communion together. Okay? It was a meal that they got together to eat. Another place, walking backwards just a little bit, another document of the early church is called the Didache. This is a fun book, the Didache. It's really short. You can find it online. You can read it if you're weird like me and like to read these things. The Didache was written somewhere between 70 and 100 AD, okay? And this was written by some church leaders who said, this is an outline for how we do things in the church, okay? So chapter 10, 
in their chapters are really short. But chapter 10 of the Didache says this. It's entitled, The Prayer After the Communion. And it starts off by saying, After you are filled, give thanks. After you are filled, give thanks. And then it goes into this whole prayer. But what I want you to see is that the Didache says, after you are filled, Pliny notices they have this meal together. So I believe, and from my studying, that the early church's communion looked a little different than this. I think the early church's communion looked a little bit more like the picnics that we might have later. Brothers and sisters sitting around a table, having a meal together, and celebrating what Jesus did for them. I'm going to read one more thing before we jump into our text this morning. This is from a book called The Early Christians, and this gives, again, more history to what this meal looked like. This book says this. It says, The gifts presented in devotion, so these gifts, this is the offering, so they also received an offering. The gifts presented in devotion reflected the surrendered gratitude of the community. The first fruits of all crops and earnings, much or little, were contributed even by those who had nothing and who had to suffer privation in order to be able to make these offerings of gratitude and love. The visible thanks offering of food was used at the common meal, to which bread and wine, communion, belonged as a solemn crowning, as united with the surrender of the hearts and the offering of prayers. As fruit, fowl, flowers, grapes, wine, and bread, and all other gifts were brought to the table by those assembled, the leaders of the meeting received these gifts from them. They washed their hands. The festive elements for the Lord's Supper were separated from the rest. The, lo the loaves placed on the table in three or five rows. Wine was poured into a cup, and at times it was mixed with water. During the meal, the believers partook of all foods, thanking and praising God for all they ate. In this manner, the love meal was originally linked with the Lord's Supper of bread and wine. This meal of thanksgiving, or meal of offerings, whose gifts were used straight away to feed the poor. I'm going to read that again, because that's important. This meal of thanksgiving, or meal of offering, whose gifts were used straight away to feed the poor, and the prophets, and apostles, has no parallel in any other religion. So what what the early church's communion celebration, according to these few sources, looked like was a time when people would bring whatever they had as an offering. And it wasn't an offering of money for the leaders to go get things for the meal, but it was an offering of the meal. Right? And one person didn't know what the other person brought, Right? Don't let your right hand know what your left hand's doing. It was an offering so that everyone was able to eat. So that everyone was able to be at the table for communion, for the common meal, for the love feast. They get that term from Jude one twelve. You can look that up later too. but I believe that this context is important because there's a couple of passages that we read about communion, and honestly, growing up, I was confused. And I think this context of the early church and what they might have been doing is helpful in these places. So we're going to read a couple of these pretty common. I know they're common because we've read them here a lot, and we're going to do it again. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 17. This is one of those places 
where I remember growing up and hearing this, and again, I was kind of confused, and you'll see why. Verse 17 of chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians says, But in the following instructions, I do not commend you. This is, this is, this is fun to read after going through 1 Thessalonians, where Paul's all excited, and he's like, you guys are doing so good. Right? Now we're turning to 1 Corinthians, he's like, you guys aren't doing so good. Hmm. I do not commend you, because when you come together, it's not for the better, but for the worse. <sighs> for in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. This is sort of outside where I'm going today. I'm excited for the marriage supper of the Lamb because there's no more divisions. But it's, it's interesting <laughs> that divisions are there so that we know who's true. <laughs> We're united by Jesus. So those who aren't, we get to ask why. What's going on? Why can't we be united in these ways? Anyway, verse 20. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. So again, remember our context of communion from a month ago. Right? All those different things and the fact that Jesus was serving his disciples. Right? And now we learn that the early church has this common meal. And we learn that Corinthians isn't doing so great. Verse 21. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, and another gets drunk. This is where I was confused growing up. Because this passage was used to say, and I think they're correct, but it was used to say, look out for your brother and your sister who are sitting next to you. Because if you do what the Corinthians were doing, then you're only going to be looking out for yourself, and you're only going to be gorging yourself. But then they passed out communion, and I was like, how am I going to gorge myself <laughs> on this? I, I don't understand, right, <laughs> when you're fasting. I didn't eat breakfast. This is just going to make me more hungry. But I think our context of a full meal helps us understand what the Corinthians are doing, right? I believe that what Paul is saying here is that they weren't looking out for each other. They were saying, that's the dish I brought. I'm eating it. We have a picnic, and Jenny's mom makes the best baked beans in the whole wide world, and I want to eat all of them. That would not be very loving to everyone else at the picnic, right? We have to be looking out for each other during communion. This church in Corinth wasn't doing that. They were looking out for themselves. They were saying, give me the food. I want it. And it was the people who were bringing the food who were saying that, which means that the people who didn't have food to bring left just as hungry as they came. This is another part of communion that we can't miss. Jesus served his disciples at communion. We must be serving each other somehow during communion, right? We don't necessarily do a full meal, right? We, we do this, right? Which is, which is fine. But we have to be looking out for each other as well. We can't forget why we're here. Verse 22. Paul says, What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. This is a feast, again, I'm going to say this a lot, 
for the offering was practical. The offering came to be shared immediately. This was a love feast, an agape feast, a feast where everyone has a seat at the table. No matter what you do every other day of the week, you get to sit at the table. A feast where the whole body ate. Because remember, if you don't feed your body, then there's no way you're going to be bodybuilding. Right? You're just going to be getting lightheaded and frustrated and wonder why you don't have energy. It's because your brother or your sister is in need and you're not helping them. The whole body needs to eat. I'm going to jump ahead to verse 33. 33 and 34 say this. It says, So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, this is what you do. Wait for one another. If anyone's hungry, let him eat at home. So that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. Do you guys ever see the Snickers commercials? You're not you when you're hungry, right? I'm going to read into this a little bit for a second. This isn't scripture either. But I wonder if these people were coming together to eat, smelling all their delicious food at home, and just waiting to eat. So by the time they got to church to have the common meal, they were so hungry, all they could think about was their own hunger. Right? The people who had the food to cook at home to bring to the meal, they don't know what true hunger is. The poor people who were there really know what true hunger is. So Paul's saying, why don't you just eat? Eat so that you can eat together later. You have enough at home to eat at home and eat at the meal. So how about you eat at home? Then come together. It's important that we can think clearly as we help and we serve one another, right? It's important that we're filled so that we can fill others. See, when we have the context of this being a whole meal instead of the bread and the cup, I think it helps us understand that when we do have just the bread and the cup and we're all sitting there basically fasting because we forgot to eat breakfast this morning, we can go, I wonder about my brother or sister who's sitting next to me. Are they in need? If we were a part of the early church, we'd be sitting around a table and we'd be asking each other, Are you in need? We would be so connected that we would know about those who are in need so that we can help them. So that when we go out as a part of the body, the light of Jesus really can go with us because we all have everything we need for life. We have everything we need. I'm going to turn back a little bit earlier to Acts chapter 2. I'm going to turn to Acts chapter 2. This is another one of those passages that I read and I long for us to be to be this church. Right? You'll see why. Acts chapter 2 starting in verse 42. Well, actually, I'm going to give you a little context. So this is very early in the church, right? Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. There's a hundred-ish people saved, right? These people go out and speak in all sorts of tongues that other people in the town know the language. They hear the gospel in their own language. And we're told in verse 41 that that day there were about 3,000 souls added to the kingdom. So what did these 3,120-ish people do? That's what 
verse 42 is saying. It says this, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, scholars believe that's communion, and to prayer. So these people, these believers, this very first church, really, they devoted themselves to teaching of the apostles, the word. They devoted themselves to fellowship. They devoted themselves to prayer. In all of these things, they were really devoted to one another. They were devoted to one another in such a way that they got together constantly to do these things. Verse 43. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Isn't that incredible? They're so connected to each other through these meetings where they come together. They're so connected that they basically have no regard for themselves. With no regard for themselves, everyone can have regard for each other, right? A lot of times we think that I need to look out for myself, but how much better is it if I have 3,000 other people looking out for me and I don't even worry about myself because I have 3,000 other people worried about me? That's what they were doing, right? They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need, right? If someone's hot water tank broke, they didn't have hot water tanks. If someone's hot water tank broke, they didn't have to worry about it because they had another one at their door before they could even, like, how did, how'd you know? Well, I heard from such and such and such and such that you were talking to when we were all together, so I sold a sheep, bought you a hot water tank, this, this example got real weird because we're just going through generations now, but it's fine. But that's what they were doing. They were so connected. They were so together. <laughs> they had no regard for themselves. They were just selling their possessions and giving to those who were in need. Verse 46, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, They received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Jesus says that the the world will know us by our love, right? That's what they're doing. They're loving each other so well that people in the community see it. So day by day, it's, it's like, It's like real easy fishing, right? You're just pulling them in. The point of this, these examples, is that we can see how communion, the communion meal, allows us to see each other's need and to help each other out. If in communion I'm only worried about myself, that's what 1 Corinthians is talking about. Don't do that. That's taking communion in an unworthy manner. But if during communion I'm thankful that even though I'm hungry and this isn't going to fill me up, I'm thankful that I have food after the service, I can be thankful for that. And then I can go, I wonder who doesn't. And I can help those who don't. We can recognize that God has richly blessed us to bless others. The communion meal in the early church did that for them. We don't have to do the same thing. 
Maybe we'll do something. We don't have to do the same thing, but we do need to be looking out for each other. We do need to be asking, who needs help? We do need to be so connected that we know when Fred's hot water tank breaks and we can drop one off at his house. So the question I then ask is, what happened? <laughs> right? If the early church was having these common meals, what happened? And there's actually a lot of letters and different things from church leaders who talk about this. The earliest one is by a guy named Tertullian, who's a church father that people talk about, and I don't think he's a great guy, but he was a church leader, and Tertullian writes in 150 AD that he's splitting the communion celebration, the bread and the cup, from the love feast because of people who were only looking out for themselves. So he splits the meal up, right? Maybe he had a good reason, right? He didn't want people's hunger to ruin the spiritual aspect of communion. So they would do their communion celebration in the morning, and they'd get together later in the evening for a love feast without communion, with our communal meal without communion. The funny thing about that is, I don't know, maybe Tertullian had other reasons too, but why didn't he just go to 1 Corinthians and be like, this, just stop doing that. That's what Paul said. Paul talked about that. It was funny to me, really, that the reasons that they stopped doing the common meal, the love feast with communion, was because of the same reasons that Paul writes about in 1 Corinthians. As a teacher, I was like, sounds like an area for teaching. I don't know. The problem that I've Think that I've found is that when we when we when we create I'm going to say better plans everyone see these air quotes when we create better plans for the way we do things sometimes the meaning gets further and further away right so one of the things they did like we've said is they would again I'm going to walk you through this you would literally bring a dish to pass set it on the table, the leader would separate it all out, the communion elements from the meal elements, you would sit down and you'd eat together. And then sometime around 150 with Tertullian, we see that people's own appetites started getting in the way. So Tertullian says, well, we can still do communion and we can still do a love feast, but we're going to separate them. So then when they're doing communion, maybe they started to lose sight of looking out for each other, the offering was still the same. But then we see actually around 200 AD that the offering then changed. There was some leadership that said, I don't know what they were really thinking, but really what they said was, just bring money, we'll get the stuff. And I think the meaning got disconnected a little bit more. Because when we just give money, it kind of disconnects us from what we do, right? Ever do that? You're like, I think that's why these different businesses and stuff can be like, hey, do you just want to round up and give to whatever organization? And they're like, sure. I don't know where it's going. But when we actually give to what is needed, then we're more invested, right? So with all these different steps, we've gotten further and further away from the meaning that we're supposed to be serving one another as a part of communion. So, as we partake in communion this morning, we do need to remember the things that we talked about last month, right? That this bread is a representation of Jesus and what he did on the cross as the Passover lamb. That this cup, juice, is the new covenant in his blood that we're free from sin. It's a redemption cup. But we also need to remember that in all of this, Jesus was serving his disciples, and we need to be serving one another, looking out for each other, just like they did in the love feast.
Because if we have people in our body who are hungry, then we're not going to be loving each other very well. We need to be looking out for each other. So know this. This is where we come back to the title at the beginning. Everybody needs to eat so that none will be in need. Everybody needs to eat so that none will be in need. There was a purpose with the love feast and the fact that it was tied to communion. So today we just have to remember to care for each other, to be so connected that we know when people need help. Dear God, I thank you for the examples that you've given us in Scripture. I also thank you for the uh, historical documents that we can see of the early church, and we can see their reasons and even question them and ask why, and even ask what's good for us today. I thank you for that freedom, Lord. Dear God, I pray that as we come now to partake in the bread and in the cup, that we wouldn't forget about our brothers and sisters who are sitting in this room who might be struggling themselves. That we would be so connected with each other that we would have everything in common. That your light would shine out because of our love for one another. Dear God, I thank you for these examples. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24. Paul's again talking about communion, and he says this. It says, when he had given thanks, that's Jesus, had given thanks, he broke it. He broke the bread and said this. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Everyone take and eat. First Corinthians 11, verse 25 and 26. Go on to say, in the same way he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Oh, uh-huh.
Dear God, I think of the church in Thessalonians as we've been reading about that Paul says that he doesn't need to instruct them in love because the Spirit's already done it. They're already loving each other. They don't need instruction. They know to care for one another, to look out for one another. They know to have everything in common. Dear God, I pray that you would give this body, this local church, a love that can only be explained by the teaching of the Holy Spirit. That you would show each of us in our hearts how to love like that. I think that I read Acts chapter 2, 42 to 47, and I get excited about it, but then I say, how do you start this? Lord, I believe we start this by being the first ones to do it. This is a teaching from the Holy Spirit that we would love each other to the point that I would have no regard for myself and I would have the faith that people would have regard for me. That the body, that brothers and sisters would come together to care for one another in this way. So Lord, we pray and we ask for this kind of love for one another. That we would look at the love that you had for us and we would extend it to each other. Lord, if anyone is in need, I pray that you reveal it to those who can help them. Give us conversations with people that we might have never even talked to in this building before, that grow into relationships that can really be like the ones we see in Acts chapter 2. Thank you, Lord, for who you are and all you do. In your name I pray. Amen.